Good evening and welcome to the Figgy Art Museum's virtual Thursdays of the Figgy series. My name is Melissa Moore and I'm Director of Education here at the Figgy and I'm very happy you could join us tonight. For the time being, we're hosting these virtual programs on most Thursdays, so please make sure to check out the Figgy's website for information on upcoming programs. We're able to offer these programs at no cost to you, just like we did in the before times in person because of the generous sponsorship provided by Chris and Mary Rayburn. Chris and Mary, thank you so much. While these programs are free to watch, I do encourage you to consider becoming a Figgy member. Your support as a member really helps us continue to fulfill our mission of bringing art and people together, even when we can't be together in person. So a quick note about tonight. If you have any questions during the program, please enter them into the Q&A and we'll get to them during a latter portion of the program. But you can enter them at any time. We, we will get to them. And if we don't, I will email you afterwards and we can follow up. So with that, let us begin. We have a very special treat tonight. Here to introduce our featured speaker is Kent Pilcher, president of Estes Construction. It's my great pleasure to welcome Kent to the program as it's due to the generous sponsorship from Estes Construction that we're able to host exhibitions like For America, which inspire programs like the one we're about to experience tonight. And there's another reason why Kent is here with us this evening to introduce our speaker, but I'll let him share that. So for now, welcome Kent and thanks so much for joining us. I turn things over to you. Well, thank you, Melissa. It's wonderful to be able to welcome everyone. I understand we have people from all over the country tonight joining this uh, presentation. So that's a delight. And just a moment, we're delighted at Estes Construction because we believe deeply in, in uh, amenities like the Figgy and what they mean for our community and how they enrich our community. And so when, uh, when we were approached uh, for this sponsorship in particular, we thought it would really be a great feature to have for the Figgy. So Thank you for that opportunity and we're excited. But even more importantly tonight, I think you're gonna hear a great presentation from Renell Knight, Knight Luth. And uh, what we have in common is, uh, she is uh, assistant professor of art at Coe College, art history at Coe College. And I am a Coe College alumni, although not during her tenure there, we're quite a bit different in age. But um, I'm really proud to have her part of the Coe community. I spent 15 years on the board there and, and people like her are the backbone of Co, and certainly the backbone of community. So, uh, Renell, welcome tonight. So, with that, I'd like to give a formal introduction to Renell. She received her her PhD in art history from the University of Iowa in 2015, with an emphasis in American art, 19th century European art, and Japanese art from the Edo period. Although she has numerous interests, and we heard about a few of those a few minutes ago. Uh, including some other things in, in the art world like environmental and landscape art, women's artists, and international propaganda art, she purposefully selected her dissertation topic as combat art of World War I-2 due to her fascination with Harvey Dunn and other early 20th century American artists. So that's a very interesting topic in and of itself. While working on that, while working on her dissertation, she received a national fellowship and was recognized by the Center of Military History and the Norman Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies. Since then, she has researched and lectured on other arts created during the Great War. And as I mentioned earlier, she currently serves as the Assistant Professor of Art History at Co. So thank you for being with us tonight, Renal, and we're really looking forward to, to your uh, presentation and thank you uh, to all of you who've joined us. All right. Thank you, Kent. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you both for, for uh, um, Kent for giving that awesome introduction. Go Cohawks. Uh, thank you, Melissa and, and the Figgy staff for inviting me here tonight. I love talking about American art history. Uh, I started out in, in the field of, of art history in a roundabout way through journalism and public relations, uh, found art history and it was my passion ever since. When I got to the University of Iowa, I, I landed on American art history. And I, I just find it fascinating. And I feel that there is so much to dig and to mine in American art history. And Kent brought up all of those uh, topics that really interest me. And I hope this will interest you a little bit as much as it has me for the last 
10 years, if not even longer. I feel like I've been working on this material for a long time, but not specifically Lila Mecklin, which leads me to a, a quick disclaimer. Lila Mecklin can kind of be a, a tough nut to crack. Um, I have barely scratched the surface uh, about this woman. Um, I know that there is still so much more that, that can be done uh, research-wise regarding her and the work that she did in the early 20th century in terms of, well, you'll see, in terms of everything art related, it seems. There is still so much to explore. In fact, I have yet to find images, photographs of her, but I know they have to exist because there are uh, archives and, um, and institutions who have scrapbooks uh, that belonged to her friends and her associates and, and things like that. So I know there has to be images out there. I just need to find them and actually get back to those institutions because unfortunately many of those scrapbooks are not, in fact, none of those scrapbooks that I've been able to find are digitized. So it's a matter of getting back into that research mode and, and finding all of the things that I need to about Lila Mecklin. And yes, I did come to Lila Mecklin via my dissertation topic on World War I art, combat art in particular. So more of that to come in this, but let's delve in just to some quick, I don't know, snapshots, stats and facts about Lila Mecklin. Um, as I said, she is kind of a, a jack of all trades, um, if you ask me. And here are just a few of the things with which she was affiliated throughout her very, very long lifetime. Uh, she was an artist. Here are some of the, the hats that I think she wore. She was an artist, an author, a critic, an editor, an exhibition organizer, an art collector, mostly from what I understand of prints. Uh, she was an educator. She was a lecturer. She did all sorts of things. Um, but I think because she was a woman and because she was so behind the scenes and so many of these organizations that she wasn't always prominent, right? So I, I want to bring her to the light. I want to put her in the spotlight for a little bit tonight. She was born in 1874 in Washington, D.C. And for the most part, Washington, D.C. would be where she would live her entire life. Um, aside from, I think, quite a bit of travel. Uh, she always seemed to be on the go. Uh, but Washington, D.C., born, raised, that's where her, her professional life was. Her mother was actually an artist, uh, Cornelia Stout uh, uh, Hyatt. Um, her mother uh, was a, a portrait painter, but her grandfather, Lila's grandfather, Cornelia's father, from what I understand, was uh, Jacob Hyatt was his name. He was also an artist. He was an, a, a printmaker engravings, etchings, things like that. So Lila comes from a lineage of artists in the 19th century, for sure. Um, she attended the Corcoran School of Art right there in Washington, DC. And the Corcoran, I think, has a, a pretty interesting history, um, especially in the, the 19th century, the, the late 19th century, of including women among its ranks in its school. Um, I have taught classes on women in American art, um, and I'm doing a program with the Figgy this month as well. And when I found this photograph, I thought it was great. Look at all these women, right? Look at all these women who are being educated at the Corcoran. Now, I really don't think Lila Mecklin is in this photograph. If I'm correct, if this was right around 1890, which I found this photograph uh, in a um, her name was Olive Rush, and she was a student at the Corcoran, and this is from her archives. Um, so if it is right around 1890, Lila Mecklin would have been, what, 15, 16 years old. Maybe she's in there, but I, I really don't think so. Now, indeed, there are a few men in there, likely instructors, right? A couple over here as well. But I love this. I love that there's a dog. There's a dog. I love dogs. There's a dog here, right? And here's Olive, uh, noted in the photograph. Side note, the other reason why I love this photograph is because of this painting over here, which I can't remember the name of it. But growing up in central South Dakota, 
not having much exposure to art. My parents had a small reproductive print, color print of this painting. And my family would always go, man, that's a really interesting painting. We would make up stories about that painting. Um, you know, what was happening in it? What was the narrative? And my sisters and I, we never knew who made that painting. And when I came across it in this photograph, I'm like, oh my gosh, sisters, we have I figured it out, right? Um, and look how big it was. It was not that big in my house. It was a small reproductive print, but it was cool nonetheless, right? So she attends the, uh, the Corcoran School of Art right there in Washington, DC. The Corcoran, um, as a museum, the, the Corcoran was right next to the White House. Unfortunately, it's no longer a museum. It has shuttered its doors. Its collection has gone over to the, the National Gallery of Art, uh, but the school is still there uh, in Washington, DC. Nonetheless, women were starting to become more and more prevalent in the arts in the, the at least the last half of the 19th century. They were able to take classes. They were able to work professionally, um, oftentimes as art educators. Uh, but some of them did make their bread and butter by being commercial artists, professional artists um, as well. Lila Mecklen though, you know, sorry to say, but art making was not for her. She quickly finds her way into art criticism. And in the year 1900, and for the next 45 years or so, she would work as an art critic for the Washington Star newspaper at various times uh, and based on um, publication dates and, and, and runs of the week and stuff like that. It's also called the Evening Star, the Washington Evening Star, and then its Sunday edition was called the Sunday Star. Many of her articles uh, as art reviews, art exhibition reviews showed up in the Sunday Star. And many times she was reviewing exhibitions that were held at the Corcoran Gallery. So I think uh, working as an art critic for all those critic, all those years in Washington, DC, the fact that she was born there, she had studied at the Corcoran. She knew the lay of the land, which I can only imagine would give her more confidence as an art critic as well. Now, don't get me wrong. She wrote for other media outlets as well. Um, uh, she wrote, I, I found articles of hers uh, published in the New York Times, the Century Magazine, Harper's Magazine, Cosmopolitan. She also contributed to the Encyclopedia Britannica, which I thought was pretty cool, right? Um, but she's, she's very prolific. And I'll talk more about that at the end of my presentation. She's also a member of the Washington Society of Fine Arts. It was founded in 1890. She joins in um, uh, 1907, uh, maybe a little bit earlier than that, but at least by 1907, she is the secretary of that organization. Um, what I do know is that upon the 50th anniversary of that organization, they hold an exhibition uh, in 1940, 41, uh, somewhere in there. And she actually wrote a brief, as it's described, a brief history of the Washington Society of Fine Arts. I can imagine that here it is, eight, you know, 1940. Um, she's going to die in 1949, so she's lived a long life. I can imagine that even though it's described as a brief history of the Washington Society of Fine Arts, I bet she had a lot of stories to tell and a lot of information to impart in that brief history. Um, she also, and, and this is how, it, how she becomes affiliated with the uh, American Federation of Arts, which is the organizer, I, I hope that's the right way to say it, the, organization, the organizing entity um, for the exhibition at the figure right now for America, um, uh, the, the portraits and the artworks from the National Academy of Design, right? Um, so the AFA is continuing to do what it has been doing all along, organizing exhibitions and, and sending them out across the United States and beyond, right? Um, she was one of the founding members in 1909 of the AFA. Now, don't get me wrong, the AFA does a lot, a lot more than just organizing exhibitions and sending them out to different venues. Uh, and, and she, Lila Mecklen, 
had a big part in all of those other things. And I'll touch briefly on some of those other things that the AFA does. But she was a founding member, one of the few women who were founding members. Uh, amongst her ranks was an art historian. Um, um, and those two women, uh, Lila Mecklen, and I can't remember the other woman's name, they held prominent positions on the board and um, within the organizational structure. In fact, Lila Mecklen, um, when the organization was founded, uh, she became the assistant secretary from 1909 to 1912. Uh, she was serving alongside the, the, the true secretary, the main secretary of the AFA, who was named Francis David Millet. Um, and Millet, I, he too is a fascinating individual, an artist, a writer, uh, he was a painter, he was a sculptor, um, he was, uh, he, he, he just had a dynamic life. And very little has been written about F.D. Millet, um, but there is some material out there. Millet was born in 1848 and, uh, you know, he served in the Civil War, likely buying, lying about his age to, to serve in the Civil War. Uh, he was active in academies and schools. Um, he was involved with the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, the, the uh, World's Columbian Exposition. Uh, he dies in 1912 uh, in, in, aboard the Titanic. Um, and uh, he, he did a lot of transatlantic travel, a lot of work in Europe and then back here in the United States. And he dies uh, on the Titanic. So in 1912, Lila Mecklen ascends to the role of secretary for the AFA. And it would be a role that she would hold, I, I've seen differing dates until 1927 or up until 1933. As secretary, she had a lot of responsibilities, okay? Um, you know, the, the secretarial duties that we would normally think of. But she also, you know, recording the minutes of, of meetings, uh, um, doing the day-to-day -day logistics and making sure communication is imparted to other board members. Um, but she also did a lot of the coordination of those exhibitions that, that the AFA sponsored and went across the, the United States. Another thing she did is she worked with the, the American Magazine of Art, okay? Um, at first, uh, the American Magazine of Art, by the way, is really the, the, the media outlet, the voice of the AFA. Uh, and it first starts in 1909 as Art and Progress. By 1916, it's renamed the American Magazine of Art. Uh, it would... Uh, have its name changed again in 1937. I didn't put it on my slide to just the the magazine of art. I've also seen it in some places titled the American Magazine of Fine Arts. Um, but for the most part, I know it as the American Magazine of Art. It was the American Magazine of Art that I was most affiliated with, most connected with, did most of my research on um, in terms of my dissertation. Uh, so I call it the American Magazine of Art. Um, she would work with the magazine. She would be the editor for several years, and she would work with the magazine up to 1932, 1933, somewhere in there. Many of the things that she wrote were um, uncredited. She did not have a byline, uh, but many of the things I, I have come to conclude are her words. And um, sometimes she's credited not at the beginning of the articles with a byline by Lila Mecklen, but at the end of articles, sometimes with her full name. Um, and I believe I've also seen just initials. And I'm like, ah, that's got to be her, Lila Mecklen, right? LM. Um, so I believe she, she wrote uh, numerous dozens, if not hundreds of articles for the American Magazine of Art. Some of, and it's at this point where I kind of want to deviate a little bit from Mecklen's biography, and I want to discuss what I would call her words and deeds. Uh, and this is part of my dissertation. My dissertation focused on the AEF-8, the American um, uh, Expeditionary Forces. The, A, the American Expeditionary Forces, those were the, the, that was the name of our troops that were sent abroad to France during World War I. 
And many people were calling for the establishment of an artist core that would be uh, ensconced over in Europe and produce artwork that would be used for documentary purposes, as well as for propaganda purposes. I have started to call these eight men the AEF-8, the American Expedition Forces 8. It just rolls off the tongue and it's a lot easier to write uh, AEF-8. These were the eight men, okay? William Aylward, Walter Duncan, Harvey Dunn, George Harding, Wallace Morgan, Ernest Pichotto, J. Andre Smith, and Harry Townsend. Together, these eight men would produce depending on how you want to count them, between 600 and 800 works of art within a relatively short amount of time when they were abroad. Here's a quick timeline. Uh, July 1914, war begins in Europe. It wouldn't be until April 6, uh, 1917, that the United States officially declares war on Germany and the American Expeditionary Forces begin to mobilize. Um, by February 1918, so almost an entire year later, the AEF-8 are selected. And it's unfortunate that there was that huge lag of time uh, before they were officially selected. They could have been abroad much, much earlier in documenting the works of the Doughboys uh, for a much longer duration. But February 1918, they're selected. By the spring, anywhere, April, May, right in there, they arrive in France. And then, you know, goodness gracious, uh, so happy that armistice is declared in November of 1918. But really, those artists were just starting to get their footing like in August, September, October. Uh, so they didn't have much time to really produce a lot of art. Again, I go back, they made 600 to 800 works of art, which is still very, very impressive. But they were also hoping the AF8, they were hoping that they would be able to um, stay in Europe longer. Some of them did stay until April, May of 1919. Um, but they were rather disappointed uh, in themselves. And many people back in the United States were also disappointed by the AF8's output as well. There were numerous exhibitions. Um, and I always start out in the summer of 1918 in general headquarters in France, the AEF-8 put their first set of works on display. Let me just note, these eight men did not call themselves the AEF-8. Again, that's my heading for them. That's my nickname for them. In the summer of 1918, their first artworks end up at the White House for viewing by President Woodrow Wilson. And then they go to the Corcoran Gallery in November of 1918, right around the time of the armistice, right? And who is reviewing that exhibition at the Corcoran Gallery? You guessed it, Lila Mecklen. From there, she becomes somewhat affiliated with the Allied War Salon. And that is because one of the organizers of the Allied War Salon Salon was a, an affiliate of Mecklen's and his name was Duncan Phillips. And if you're familiar with that name, it's probably because of the Phillips collection of art, which is in Washington, DC. That's the same Duncan Phillips, right? And from there, uh, from the Allied War Salon, which wasn't just the AF 8s artworks, it was hundreds of artworks from the, the Allied forces, the Allied countries, France, England, uh, and, and others, other countries had art, Canada, they had artworks in the Allied War Salon, along with the AF-8 and other American artists works. From there, the AFA really takes over and it's Lila Mecklen, who is specifically tagged to take on the rest of the exhibition route for the AF-8 artworks. Indeed, in January of 1919, they go to the Carnegie Institute in Pittsburgh. Um, and they're still, that exhibition is not just AEF-8, it's, it's other artworks from the Allied War Salon, but it's definitely pared down. Starting in February and on through the rest of the exhibition circuit, February 19 to August 1919, uh, those are uh, AEF-8 specific exhibitions. And again, all of that was coordinated by Lila Mecklen. And in many ways, she was very influential 
in the promotion of those exhibitions as well as the logistics. Um, you know, how they should be framed, how they should be promoted, how what frames specifically to use so that they're lighter and more transportable. Is that a word? Um, uh, and, and she's the one also kind of working with these institutions to help promote the exhibitions too. And I don't think she gets a lot of credit for that. But she is affiliated with many of these institutions. In particular, I call your attention to the Telfair Art Museum in Savannah, Georgia, which is still in existence. Uh, she uh, served on their, their uh, board of directors as well um, later on, uh, not in 1919, but, but later on. Uh, so she had connections, I believe, the way I look at it, to all of these places uh, and many of these institutions. Uh, as I mentioned, the first exhibitions of the AFA artworks were at general headquarters and numerous favorable comments from, uh, from notable generals and, and other soldiers who are, uh, who are overseas uh, in France at that time. And many of these generals actually write back to the War Department in Washington, D.C. saying, you need to do more to support these artists. They're, they're doing the best they can, right? And then they go to the White House for private display by Woodrow Wilson and the Secretary of War, Newton Baker. Now, um, it's at this point I want to give like a little, a little, you know, behind the scenes gossip, right? Um, Woodrow Wilson was asked to provide some sort of comment about the AF8 artworks. And I think Lila Mecklin would have loved any little nugget from Woodrow Wilson, anything, right? Now, two, two theories here, right? Woodrow Wilson, Newton Baker, a little bit busy with that thing called the Great War, running the country, overseeing the military, probably didn't have time for comments, right? Um, but Woodrow Wilson, his first wife was named Ellen, Ellen Axon Wilson, and she was an artist. She was a painter, a pretty decent painter as well. Uh, she and Woodrow would um, uh, spend their summers with artist colonies along the East Coast. Uh, he saw her paint. Uh, she won some, some awards for her work in juried uh, exhibitions. Uh, and so Woodrow Wilson knew how to speak and, and think about art. I firmly believe that, right? Um, unfortunately, Ellen Axon Wilson dies uh, almost as soon as Wilson um, moves into the White House for his first term. Uh, they had a studio set up for her in the White House uh, and, and she passes away. It's, it's really quite sad. Um, but again, Wilson, he could have commented. Instead, he leaves it to Lila Mecklen. These artworks are officially organized and put on display at the Corcoran Gallery in 1918. Uh, November of 1918, to be specific, right? Uh, starting November 19th, a week and a few days, seven days after Armistice is called, uh, the, the exhibition opens. And Lila Mecklen ends up writing several articles for the Washington Star and the Sunday Star. It's, it's affiliated Sunday edition, right? And she really kind of defends these combat artists, right? Um, and, and, and that's because there was always already word on the street that many of these artworks by these eight men were not that good. And there I could get into the reasons why and defend the AF8 in, in so many ways, but I'll leave it to Lila Mecklen, right? There are logistical problems that those eight men faced, but she is defending them in terms of, of journalistic power, right? She, she's able to do it this way. She writes that the purpose of the War Department in appointing these official artists was not merely to secure a pictorial record of the war, superior to those obtainable through the medium of photography. So right there, she's saying illustration, painting, drawing, uh, those are, those, that's different than photography. So right there, she's saying, okay, we're doing something different than photography. She goes on but to obtain material which through the medium of the periodical press could be used to keep the activities of our army graphically before the American public. Naturally, therefore, 
In selecting the artists, preference was given to men who had experience in magazine illustration. Many people said, hey, these eight guys are illustrators. They're not easel painters. When in fact, those eight men, most of them, seven of the eight, were truly academically trained easel painters, but they found their bread and butter as being illustrators. What I love about this is that Lila Mecklen really wasn't a snob when it came to art. She said, illustration is important, right? And maybe it's her journalistic background, but also in saying, hey, we need the commercial arts. We need illustrators. Uh, we also need painters too. But what the illustrator can do is work quick on the ground, uh, get their artworks done, and make them suitable for the press and for propaganda purposes, okay? Um, the AFA, many of them did want to, and many of them did produce large oil on canvas paintings as well. And many of those did make their way back to the United States, albeit with some delays. Um, the, the War Department was not a good organizer of the AF-8 while they were in France. They lost some of their artworks, the War Department did. The War Department had that tricky little censorship thing, right? And the War Department really didn't know what to do with these artists. Um, but Lila Mecklen knew how to spin it so that these artists would get their due rewards back in the United States. And she would promote this exhibition at the Corcoran and dare I say at other venues as well. Um, and just to kind of clarify a little bit, uh, she, uh, you know, talking about illustration versus painting in the realm of art history uh, for centuries, for millennia, the big three in art considered the high arts were painting, sculpture, and architecture. Things like printmaking, uh, illustration, photography, uh, the, the lower ceramic arts like pottery, uh, which I don't think of them as lower arts, but they were considered the lower arts. Uh, they were considered not as, uh, as high, <laughs> as prominent, as important as painting, sculpture, and architecture. So she's defending these men for sure. She also uh, was, a, you know, she had like her finger on the pulse in Washington, DC. And she wasn't afraid to take on some of those other artists and other critics who were critical of the AF8 artworks. In particular, she took on the granddaddy of American illustration and printmaking and his name was Joseph Pinnell. Joseph Pinnell had himself spent some time in Europe at the beginning of the war, trying to produce a body of work that illustrated the war, right? Um, he went over there, I wanna say in 1917, but I could be wrong about that. And he, he really uh, was critical of the AF8 works. In fact, in February of 1919, he even had an article published. He had seen the AF8 artworks in a variety of venues. And in February of 1919, he wrote, these artist officers of the United States Army sent home their work and it is now touring the country. Much of it is beneath contempt with here and there a few good uh, a good, a few good, though unimportant sketches. The excuse is most universally made that these are mere sketches to be worked up by the artists when they get back. Well, Lila Mecklen did not like that at all, right? And she had heard through the grapevine that Joseph Pinnell was making these comments, right? Um, even before he published his article in February of 1919. In fact, she wrote about the, the Corcoran exhibition. 
she made a comment and maybe he's responding to her comment, right? Maybe there's a little bit of hearsay and there's a little bit of back and forth. But she wrote, when Joseph Pinnell went to France more than a year ago to make a series of lithographs for, of war work in France at the invitation of the French government, he found conditions such that he frankly admitted defeat and after a few weeks trial left the country without having accomplished his purpose. So, you know, Mecklen, finger on the pulse of the art world, ready to, to defend, ready to be on the attack at any point in time, for sure. The fact that she did that against Joseph Pinnell, I think says a lot about her, her guts, right? And her confidence. From the Corcoran, the artworks go to the Allied War Salon. Uh, the Allied War Salon was, like I said, this huge exhibition of art in New York City. And there were three coordinators. There was Duncan Phillips, there was Augustus Vincent Tack, who was an artist, he was a sculptor, uh, and, uh, and a painter too. Anyway, um, and then there was Albert Eugene Gallatin. And Gallatin himself had tried his hand at painting, uh, but he comes, becomes most notable as being a collector. Well, uh, Gallatin ends up writing a book. I wouldn't call it necessarily an exhibition catalog, but it was a book that seems to correspond to the Allied War Salon. The name of his book was Art and the Great War. Um, and he, uh, he is not favorable of the AF-8 either, right? But, uh, you know, he specifically says that it should be Lila Mecklen, and he's corresponding with members of the War Department who are overseeing the AF-8. It's Gallatin who says, um, you, should, you should have Lila Mecklen take over the AF-8 Artworks War Department. You should have them do it. Uh, you should have Mecklen do it uh, so, that, uh, it's, so that this art is, is better taken care of and things like that even though Gallatin was not a fan of their artworks. Mecklen, I think, my opinion, and there's, there's more to talk about those exhibitions, but I won't belabor it tonight. Mecklen was, um, I believe she wrote this article about art has power. It's an unattributed article in the American Magazine of Art, um, but she's relating it to wartime. Uh, in the time of war, art is one of the heaviest sufferers, yet those are, there are those who believe that from the ashes of the past will rise a new art. Such belief is not unreasonable, for it is only when we come very close to the realities, the great fundamental things of life, that we realize how immensely valuable art is. I think it's an important thing to note that she's writing that in May of 1917, really before the AF-8 are even in existence. But I take this quote as her saying, all art is important. All of the art is important. And going back to, to Art and the Great War, where Gallatin was so mean uh, and so critical of the AF-8, she stuck with them. Lila Mecklen stuck with them. After the, the artworks leave New York City and head to, to Pittsburgh, to the Carnegie Institution, some artworks are missing uh, of the AF-8 artworks. Uh, they're missing, they're gone, they're, they, they can't be found. And Mecklen has a back and forth with Gallatin. She's like, you gotta find these things. She is a logistical taskmaster and she doesn't mind working uh, through the power of the press or behind the scenes to make sure that all art, whether it's deemed good or bad or high or low, that all art gets its due and that all art is respected because in a time of war, art is still important, right? All right, I'm gonna wrap this up here. Going back to Mecklen and her own biography. By the way, I could talk all day about the other things that she wrote and she did uh, for the AF-8, but let's get back to her biography overall. She ends up receiving honorary degrees from uh, George Washington University, a master, an honorary degree, master of arts degree uh, from GWU. Again, right there in Washington, DC, right close to the Corcoran Gallery and School. 
Uh, um, it is, uh, you know, she was very closely affiliated with every institution in Washington, DC. And then in 1929, the University of Nebraska uh, awards her a Doctor of Fine Arts, an honorary degree uh, as a Doctor of Fine Arts. Um, her affiliation with GWU, very likely, but you may be scratching your head why the University of Nebraska. Um, that is because the, AF, the AFA realized that much of their membership, whether it was individuals or institutional memberships, were from the East Coast. And the AFA said, we're the American Federation of Arts. We should be more continental, right? We should have from coast to coast members. So um, uh, in the 19, well, right away in 1920, the AFA decides to open up branch uh, headquarters, if you will, uh, branch offices in two different places. One was at the University of Nebraska, which it would later be moved to Omaha. And then the other one was out at Stanford University uh, in California, uh, California, right? Both of those branches closed down um, Stanford in 1927, but Nebraska's closed in 1930. And I think she had a huge part of that. She was, um, I think she was an advocate for that uh, more inclusivity of artists from coast to coast, more inclusivity uh, she would speak at other institutions uh, in Denver, uh, out on the West Coast. She knew that in order for the AFA, and I believe other members of the AFA did too, but she realized that in order for this, to, this organization to succeed and to thrive, uh, they had to have more of, of a presence. Um, and I believe her connections through the AFA with that branch office at the University of Nebraska, I think that helped her to get that, that honorary degree from, um, from, from Nebraska. Um, she also was appointed as the director. I think this is so cool. She was appointed the director of the International Exhibition of Art, which was in affiliation with the Olympic Games in Los Angeles which by the way, the AFA also had an exhibition, um, art in relationship to sports or in relation to sports was on display in Los Angeles at the Museum of History, uh, Museum of History, Science and Art uh, in 1933. So this 32, 33. So this exhibition uh, hosted by the AFA in Los Angeles in connection with the Olympic Games and the fact that my, my, Lila Mecklen was the, internet, the director of the International Exhibition of Art at that same time, I think speaks volumes to the amount of respect that she had in the art world at this time, right? Um, other endeavors, uh, she served on, uh, as, as on the board of directors with the Telfair Academy in Savannah, Georgia. Again, one of the venues that the AF8 Artworks went to. Uh, the Mint Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina. She also served as, um, I think the best way to put it would be like a, a, an art consultant, maybe an art advisor at the University of North Carolina and the University of Virginia. And then in 1940, she was elected as a fellow to the Royal Society of Arts in London. And in fact, when she, when she dies in, um, in uh, 1949, uh, the Royal Society of Arts actually published a very lovely obituary about Lila Mecklen, really praising her work. Uh, numerous publications uh, are, were scripted by Lila Mecklen. Art in Life in Washington, Works of Art in Washington, Appreciation of Art, Some American Figure Painters. Not all of these are huge volumes. Some of them are quite small, but some of them did have repeat publications as well. Um, she also was an educator. She crafted a, a course through the, the American Library Association uh, talking about the appreciation of art, right? She dies in 1949 in Washington, D.C., beloved by the art community, dare I say, right? But some stats and facts. I would say that through the AFA, she organized hundreds of ex exhibitions doing all of that logistical behind the scenes work, which is so 
tedious uh, and, and, and have, you have to be so detail oriented, right, in order to do that. Literally hundreds, I would guess, were, were under, under her control. And then I have found at least 130 bylines to her credit, right? Um, that does not include every uncredited article that she wrote for the Ameri American Magazine of Arts, nor does it include the articles that uh, were not necessarily attributed to her in the Washington Star and its affiliates, uh, nor does it include the annual reports that she drafted for the AFA. And overall, uh, just doing a, a search on some other databases, academic databases, and sort of totaling everything up, I would guess that she has probably about 600 credits, author credits to her name, uh, which I think is fabulous and, and fantastic that her voice would have had, uh, would have been that prominent and, and would have had that influence. So that is all I have to share today. I hope I'm within your timeline here, uh, uh, Melissa. Um, and I'm welcome. I welcome questions at this point too. So I'm going to stop sharing, but I can come back into my PowerPoint too. So, Renelle, when you say that's all you have to share, I have to laugh. That was so wonderful and so much amazing information that I um, I know that everyone who's on this program tonight has learned something new and probably has a question, even if it isn't a question they're ready to articulate. Um, there's a lot of thinking happening in response. So I, first I wanted to say thank you so much for sharing. We have, the pleasure, pleasure. Yeah. we have the pleasure of working with Rennell um, for a program, an intensive crash course in American art history for our docents last week, which was all equally as wonderful. And for those of you who want to, to learn more, about the, you know, that this time period, but also others, Dr. Rennell Knightley is going to be presenting an art history class that is open to members of the public starting this Sunday. So it's women in American art who weren't artists. And as you can tell from her passionate presentation tonight, this is something she cares about deeply and we're excited to, to welcome her back for that program starting this Sunday. So check out online if you're interested in joining. But now um, I see that we have some some compliments coming into you, Renelle. So again, thank you from all of our audience members. Um, let's go ahead and check the chat and the questions and see if there's anything that we want to. Yeah, I think many of the, the comments were, uh, you know, kudos, but also giving me the, the, the title of that painting and the artist's name, yes, which I have it tucked away in a file somewhere, but thank you to those of you who brought it back for me. Um, yeah, that was, uh, yep, that's exactly what it was. And, and I should do more research on that painting uh, because it looks, it's, it's just a warm part of my childhood for sure. Yep. Well, Renelle, I know with programs on Thursday nights, often what happens is we have so much information that we're processing. Questions come to our audience members in the middle of the night, they, they wake them up. Um, and they end up emailing them to me, of course, to our audience members. Again, my name is Melissa, and I'm the one who sent you the link for the program this evening. So you do have my email address. Renelle, if you're okay with it, could I send you or forward you any questions that come through that we Absolutely. may get? Yeah, yep, go for it. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And I know that all of our audience members and you too, Renelle, are excited to come down and see the exhibition for America at the Figgy. Um, at this point, I just want to thank you again for offering this program in conjunction with the exhibition. It's truly a great time to celebrate. And also during National Women's History Month, it's, it's important for us to make sure that we're examining all aspects of what helps us get to what has helped us get to where we are today in the art world. So thank you for the wonderful program this evening. Yep, my, my pleasure. Yep. Well, I know that, again, uh, everyone is excited to see the exhibition. If you are comfortable coming in person, it's going to be on display at the Figgy through May 16th. For those of you who do plan to visit the museum in person, please remember to check out the Figgy's website. We have up-to-date information on our current policies and procedures, and that'll help you plan your visit. For those of you who are unable to visit or you're not ready to visit the museum in person, in person, we do have a solution for you or an option for you. We hope you'll explore our exhibition online. 
the microsite that features fully developed three-dimensional views of the exhibition, and you can interact with all of the artworks on display through this website. So if you're interested in seeing it from the comfort of your own home, please go to our website. It's figgyartmuseum.org. If you click on the Art tab on the Figgy's website and then select Virtual Exhibitions, that's going to take you to where you can access the microsite. We do hope you'll join us for upcoming virtual programs, such as the art history class I mentioned that Renelle will start this, um, this upcoming Sunday. We also have those listed on our website. If you are one of our Thursday regulars, I did want to give a little shout out for the program coming up next week. We're going to hear from Figgy Assistant Curator Vanessa Sage as she presents Rebel Artists, an exploration of European and American arts organizations, including the National Academy of Design, among others, and, um, and she's going to explore the crucial tension between the avant-garde and the traditional. So this is going to be a really fun presentation next week, and you hope you can we hope you can join us. The program, like this week, will be offered in conjunction with the exhibition for America: 200 Years of Painting from the National Academy of Design. I want to thank you all again for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Renelle. We look forward to seeing you all at future programs and maybe even in the museum one of these days. And you hope, we hope you have a wonderful evening. Good night and thanks again.